What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. We come now to Mark chapter 6 in our wonderful trip through the gospel, the story of the Lord's life from Mark, from His perspective. And we arrive at verse 14 in chapter 6. And we're going to be looking at verses 14 to 29, which is a fascinating incident. It is the account of the execution of John the Baptist, the forerunner to the Messiah and the last Old Testament prophet, and the man of whom Jesus said He was the greatest man who ever lived up until His time. The greatest man, the greatest prophet of all before Christ. This is the story of His execution. And by the way, it is the only account in the gospel of Mark that is not about Jesus. Every other account is about our Lord Himself. This alone, an account of someone else, not just anyone, but John the Baptist. Not only the forerunner of our Lord, but His cousin. The culmination of the killing of the prophets of the Old Testament era is given to us in this text as it records for us the execution of John the Baptist. The Jews rejected Jesus, we know that, and eventually, of course, they cried for His blood and said, crucify Him, crucify Him, we'd rather have Barabbas released to us, a common criminal. They rejected Jesus, but they also rejected John the Baptist. In fact, that's a package deal. If you reject Jesus, then it's clear that you have rejected John because John the Baptist was the prophet who pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was John the Baptist who said, I must decrease and he must increase. It was John the Baptist who said, He is far greater than I. I'm not even worthy to loose the strings on his sandals. So if you reject Jesus, you have rejected John. If you reject John, you've rejected Jesus. If they had received John the Baptist as a true prophet, if they had received his message as God's true word, of necessity they would have had to receive Jesus Christ, of whom John spoke. You receive them both or you reject them both. Well, they rejected them both, and both were murdered. Before us in the text in Mark 6 is a monumental account of the murder of John the Baptist. It is a preview of the murder of Jesus Christ. And though the Jews didn't actually kill John the Baptist with their own hands, Herod did. And though the Jews didn't actually kill Jesus with their own hands, the Romans did still. The Jews stood by while the murders occurred. The story of John the Baptist's murder is drama. It is as dramatic as any story in the New Testament, perhaps only exceeded by the story of the crucifixion of our Lord Himself. It is uh, at the same time an unbelievable soap opera of intrigue, iniquity, rebellion. Now by the time you get to chapter 6, John the Baptist is already in prison. Mark 1, 14 says that John the Baptist had been arrested and put into prison. 
Compared to Luke 3, 19 and 20, this would indicate that it was soon after the temptation and baptism of Christ that John was arrested. He is then a prisoner, and he's been a prisoner for a long time, certainly over a year in prison. That's um, where he's been sitting under the incarcerating power of Herod. In this text, we're going to read the account of his execution. Before we do that, we need to understand what triggers this text and this record itself. Let me read it to you, starting in verse 14. And King Herod heard of it. And we'll stop right there. Heard of what? What just was recorded. Verse 7, he summoned the twelve, began to send them out in pairs, gave them authority over the unclean spirits. Verse 12, they went out and they preached that men should repent. And they were casting out many demons and anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. And we know that they were also able to raise the dead. Remember last time we talked about the fact that our Lord had done everything Himself, all the miracles and all the preaching. But in the final sweep through Galilee for the third and last time, visiting all the towns and villages, He multiplied the messengers and multiplied the power by twelve, sending out the twelve apostles. He delegated His power to them, power over demons, disease, and death, and He gave them the message, the kingdom of God, preach repentance and entrance into the kingdom of God by faith in Me, the Messiah. And they went, and it was a blitz. It set loose a greater influence for the gospel of Jesus Christ than had occurred prior in the ministry of our Lord when He was doing it all Himself. Miracles were happening everywhere they went, dead people coming back to life, people with diseases being healed, demons being cast out, and the gospel being preached. There has never been anything like this explosion of miracles, the explosion of gospel preaching, and it led to an expanded buzz all through Galilee. The buzz finally reaches Herod. Herod lives in a in the lap of lust and luxury and laziness. Maybe prior to this he was away, or, or maybe he was just indifferent because Tiberias was a place Jesus never visited and that's where he lived. And Tiberias was a place where the Jews didn't go because it had been built by Herod on top of a cemetery and they thought it was desecrated ground and wouldn't set foot in it. So whatever secondhand reports may have come to Herod if he was in fact in that city would, uh, would have been just that, secondhand reports. But now when the impact of Jesus has been multiplied by a dozen times, it cannot escape traveling back to Him. And so it says in verse 14, He heard of it. He heard of it for His name had become well known. What does that tell you? That everything the disciples were doing, all the preaching, all the healing, all the deliverance was being done in the name of Jesus Christ, okay? Christ, of course, was the source of power. And I think the twelve made it crystal clear that the power was not theirs. After all, everybody in Galilee would have been familiar with uh, these men and their families. They had lived their whole lives there. It was a small area. They had never had this kind of power before. Even when they were with Jesus, they hadn't had it before. They made sure that everyone knew this was a delegated power and it came from Christ and what they did, they did in His name. You can see an illustration of it, Peter and John, two of them. Uh, they go into the temple in the third chapter of Acts, they find a lame man and they tell him to get up and walk in the name of Jesus. So it comes back to Herod that this name has mighty, mighty power and he is concentrating on it maybe for the very first time. Now what is happening 
this explosion of power has created a buzz that is essentially saying this is not just another prophet. Early the, the word was that he's a great prophet. That's what it says in Luke 7, 16. But they were getting beyond that. While prophets in the past had been known to do a miracle, even a resurrection in the case of Elijah and Elisha, no prophet ever had released this kind of explosion of power where everywhere he went, everyone was healed and delivered. There was no real human explanation, so um, word began to circulate that maybe this was someone who had come back from the dead with supernatural power. The people were saying, according to verse 14, John the Baptist has risen from the dead. That's one explanation. They know that John is dead by now. Herod has executed him by this point. They know that. And, and maybe he's come back from the dead, and that's why these miraculous powers are at work in him. He is really a resurrected, this Jesus is a resurrected John the Baptist. Well, Herod uh, doesn't like to hear that. Not at all. According to Luke 9, 7, Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was happening, was greatly perplexed because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead and by some that Elijah had appeared and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen again. Herod said, I myself had John beheaded, but who is this man about whom I hear such things? And he kept trying to see him. I mean, the worst possible scenario for Herod was to have the man he beheaded back from the grave. So he has reason to be concerned. Some of the people are saying John the Baptist has risen from the dead, verse 15. Others were saying he is Elijah. Because you remember, before the arrival of Messiah, Elijah was to come. According to the book of Malachi, the last book of the, we have in our Old Testament, the prophet said that Elijah had come before the great and terrible day of the Lord, before the Lord arrives. And, and maybe this is that Elijah who's come, or one of the other prophets. But when Herod heard of it, he kept saying, John whom I beheaded has arisen. Now, why does he say that? This, my dear friends, is a projection of his deepest anxiety, his greatest terror, his greatest fear. He knows John. He knows him well. He kept him incarcerated in his own palace fort prison for over a year. He knew him face to face. He will give testimony that he was a righteous and godly man. He also knows that he had him executed in a bizarre, lecherous, wicked party to satisfy his own pride and the vengeance of his own wife. And so he projects his worst fear. This must be John back from the dead. Now, that's why he wanted to see him. He knew John. He'd looked into his face many times. He wanted to check and see if, in fact, it was John. Now that brings us to the point of why did he arrest him and why did he execute him? A little bit of background about Herod. Herod is called in Luke 3, 1, a tetrarch, a tetrarch. That means a a ruler of a fourth of a region, a ruler of a fourth of a region. Israel had come under Roman power many, many years before. But wherever Rome exercised its power, it had regional rulers who were really um, serfs under Caesar, who did Caesar's bidding. Whatever power they had was minimal. And one false move and they would be replaced, if not exiled, executed. So they held their little petty territories with a very light hand, although they wielded a heavy hand on top of the residents in the areas 
where they ruled. They were low-ranking rulers who uh, took the term king because it tended to elevate them, and it was very popular in the East. The, the father of this Herod, who really is known as Herod Antipas, the father of this Herod, and there are many Herods in the Scriptures, the, the father is Herod the Great. Herod the Great uh, compounded your difficulty in understanding what Herod you're talking about in the New Testament because he had ten wives. So there were a lot of little Herods running all over the place who ended up in all kinds of situations. Herod the Great was not a Jew. He was a descendant of Esau. So he was outside the covenant that God made with Jacob. But he had attached himself to the Jewish people and on the surface uh, was a proselyte to Judaism, Herod the Great was. He was given the rule of the whole land of Israel, which he held under Rome for thirty-six years. He was an evil man, a lustful man, a vicious man, a murderous man. He uh, made a will and requested that when he died, Rome would divide the kingdom into four parts and give a part to each of four of his sons. That's what happened. He died in 4 B.C., if you calculate the calendar. And when he died, it was a very notable moment when he died because it was when he died, remember, that Joseph and Mary brought Jesus back from Egypt because they were fearful of Herod because he slaughtered all the male infants because he heard there was a king from the wise man. So when Herod the Great died, Joseph and Mary and Jesus came back to Nazareth, but the political scene changed. He had been a ruler of a unified Israel, and now it was split into those four parts. Herod the Great had indulged every evil desire one could imagine. It's the worst of men. The, the temple that stood in the time of Jesus was a product of His building, much to His own ego rather than to the honor of God. He was not impressive, and His death is described by Josephus, who loved, I think, to write this about fifty or sixty years later. He died of ulcerated entrails, putrefied and maggot-filled organs, constant convulsions, and foul breath, I would think. Just prior to his death, Herod the Great had murdered all the people he thought might be a threat to his throne, and he murdered his own son Antipater five days before his own death. He killed all the Sanhedrin, the seventy ruling elders of Israel. So after his death, the kingdom was divided. The first one was Archelaus, one of his sons, who received the rule over Judea, Samaria and Idumea. He only lasted a few years. In 6 A.D. was deposed, and Rome replaced him with a series of governors, one of them being Pilate from 26 to 36, who was critical in the role of execution of our Lord. The second area of Israel, Iturea Trachonitis, which is north and east of Galilee, was um, given to Philip, one of the Philips. There are two of them. We'll meet the other one in a moment. Uh, he didn't last very long, and he was succeeded by Herod Agrippa. He didn't last very long in Acts 12. He got eaten by worms. Uh, the third area was northwest of Galilee, called uh, that third area under the rule of Lysanias. And the fourth one was Galilee itself, all the way down Perea, down the east side of the Sea of Galilee, all the way down almost to the Dead Sea. That area went to Herod Antipas, and that's who this man is. Now all four of these men had their little piece of uh, Israel under the rule of Tiberius Caesar, a wretched, wretched man who succeeded Caesar Augustus. Tiberius was a pedophile of the rankest kind. Uh, to describe his life would, um, would, would be a, a wrong thing to do. Just the discussion itself would be sinful. Well, Herod Antipas was put under Tiberius in this position, and while the others didn't last very long, he lasted 42 years, 42 years. Through the entire life of our Lord Jesus, 
This man was the petty ruler for Rome over the realm of Galilee. He is the one, then, who uh, has the most to lose if a power movement starts, if a populist movement rises. And like the rest of the Herods, they're all paranoid about their power. And if indeed this is John the Baptist risen from the dead, and he has the power to conquer death, then Herod is in some serious trouble, serious trouble. And that's what he is convinced has happened. Verse 16, he kept saying, John, whom I beheaded, has risen. And the ego, the I in the Greek is emphatic. John, whom I beheaded. And as I said in Luke 9, 90, he kept trying to see Jesus, thinking he was a risen John the Baptist. His intentions were not good. Some Pharisees came to Jesus in Luke 13 one day and said to Him, Herod wants to see you because he wants to kill you. <laughs> kill him once, I'll kill him again. Jesus said He'll never be able to do that. You tell that fox that I will do my ministry today, tomorrow, and the third day until I reach my goal, a kind of Jewish expression to say, I'm invincible until I've accomplished my purpose, today, tomorrow, and all future days. He's not going to take me like He killed John until my work is done. Where does this fear come from? Why is, why is He so afraid? Well, because He had him beheaded. That's what He says in verse 16. In verse 17, you have a flashback. The first question is, wow, how did that happen, right? He had Him beheaded. How did that take place? And so the Holy Spirit inspires Mark to tell us the story. Two points I want to give you, Herod's fear and Herod's folly. His fear is a real fear. It's a panic. It's terror. A resurrected man that He beheaded is alive, and He must be coming after me. I want to see Him. I want to see if, in fact, He is John the Baptist. And you can believe that if um, He was going to allow, uh, if that was going to be allowed to happen, He would have created an environment in which uh, He would have had His greatest forces on display to do again to uh, John the Baptist what He had done before. It was not John the Baptist back from the dead, and our Lord never let Him have that opportunity until at the very end of His life. Here's the, the flashback in verse 17 that raised the fear. Herod himself had sent. The, the point of the Herod himself is to say this was a personal act on Herod's part. Now, this wasn't precipitated by any movement among the people. This wasn't asked for by Rome. Herod himself had sent and had John arrested and bound in prison. Where was John? According to John's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 22 to 24, he was down at Anon uh, near Salem, baptizing by the, uh, by the River Jordan, in the River Jordan. Herod must have sent some men down there, and in the middle of the ministry of John the Baptist, the ministry of calling the Jews to repentance and pointing to the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, and saying, I'm not worthy to loose his shoelaces, he's greater than I, turn to him, they arrest John the Baptist and they throw him in prison. Uh, this prison is very likely at a place called Machairus near the northeastern shore of the Dead Sea, all the way down in the southern tip of Perea. Uh, there Herod had built this massive stone fortress, palace, prison. It served all those three purposes. John was there, as I said, over a year. We don't know exactly how long. But his disciples, according to Luke 7, 18, were allowed to visit him, to see him there. He had many who had followed him, who had uh, listened to him, for whom he was their, their preacher and their teacher, and they were allowed to visit and talk to him. But the question is, why did he do this? Why did Herod arrest him in the first place and then behead him? Well, here's the rest of the story. Why did he put him in prison? On account of Herodias the wife of his brother Philip, because he had married her. 